Ave Maria. At that time, Jesus, having come to the district of Caesarea Philippi, began to ask his disciples, saying, Who do men say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then Jesus answered and said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So today we celebrate the feast of St. Celestine V. His baptismal name was Peter. He was the 11th of 12 sons. His father died while he was quite young, and his mother, her desire was that one of her sons should become a saint, and she frequently asked him the question, which one of you will be a saint? And it was Peter who said, I will be the saint. He, he had, a, again, a remarkable intelligence, and so at the age, as a teenager, he would study, did study, and at the age of 20, he decided that there was nothing in the world living for. <clears throat> and so he became a hermit. At the age of 20, he went off into the mountains, um, Morone, and there he lived as a hermit. And when we talk about hermit, literally that, he had absolutely nothing. He slept on the bare ground, he lived in, in um, a cave, he ate what he could provide with his own hands. And his spirituality became known so that other people were attracted to him. Now, he's born in the year 1210. Some think it might have been even five years later. So we're talking about the beginning of the 13th century. The 13th century was the beginning of the glory of the church, but the church really had to go into the mire before that. In the previous two centuries, it would appear as if the gates of hell had prevailed against the church. So he was born, he, born about 1210. He, he lived life of a hermit, and people were attracted to him, men. And so before he knew it, he had a little colony of, of men around him. And you, again, you need there needs to be some kind of order, some discipline. People just can't live together. And so he put together a rule, according to St. Benedict, and he had the rule approved, and again became the superior of this colony of men. In fact, there were some 600 monks, um, permits, and men and women in his order. And they had some 36 houses. But he did not want the, the responsibility of governance. And the reason? Because he, did, he recognized he didn't have the gifts himself. And so we see a, a very important lesson there, that God distributes his gifts to each of us according to our ability and disposition. What we need to do is to recognize what particular gift we have and to use that gift for the glory of God and for the salvation of our souls. If we aspire after gifts we do not have, and worse, try to exercise talents that we are not blessed with, not only do we bring um, dishonor to the holy name of God, but we also endanger our own souls. And so Peter moved away. He, he um, went further into the, into the hills, living by himself. But the order that he established was called the Celestian Order, or the Heavenly Order. The 13th century developed, there were, God had raised up many um, great saints, Dominic and Francis and, and um, uh, Thomas Aquinas and so on. And these were brilliant men. But the governance of the church was seriously, had been seriously compromised. It was seriously compromised because 
the <clears throat> power attracts the worst uh, elements of society. And so the, 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 the men who were governing the church, the cardinals, the bishops, they were more interested in worldly things rather than spiritual things. And so in 1292, the end of the 13th century, um, Pope Nicholas IV died. And the cardinals gathered um, in Perugia to elect a new pope. And for more than two years, they disputed and argued among themselves, and they couldn't find anybody. They couldn't find among themselves or anybody else to, to sit in the chair of Peter. And there were only 12 of them, 12 cardinals, 12 men. They couldn't decide which one of them was to be pope. And, of course, the, church was, the governance of the church was becoming more and more chaotic. So Peter in his hermitage, concerned about what was happening, his eyes fixed on heaven. He being in contact with, with um, God, the, the, with his devotion to Our Lady, his devotion to the saints being so well known, he took it upon himself, or he had the inspiration from God, to write to the cardinals and telling them that God was displeased with the fact that they had not, after more than two years, elected a successor to Peter. So when the cardinals received the letter, one of them, um, Malabranco, I think his name was, he, he said, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, this man should be Pope. And they all elected him unanimous, unanimously. Peter was one, is, is only one of six men who were not members of the College of Cardinals to be elected Pope. So it's an exceedingly rare occurrence, only six. When he heard the news, he was in turmoil and he attempted to run away, but he was apprehended by the king of Naples. And he, this, all his protestations that he, didn't, he was not fit and so on and so on, they ignored. The people in Rome themselves rejoiced because now they had, after such a long time, a saint as pope. But sadly, it didn't go that way. Because Peter was trapped in Naples by the king of Naples, Charles, and the king was manipulating the pope. And Peter, well, he chose the name Celestine, uh, the Celestine the Fifth. And Celestine means heavenly. His eyes were fixed on heaven, and his whole pontificate, he hoped, would be geared to leading people to heaven. But Trapped in, in, in um, Naples, under the influence of the king of Naples, there was little that he could do. In fact, the, the bishops, the, the, the um, nobles of the king were imposing on him, asking for this benefice and this favor and so on. The bishops were equally pressing on him, wanting this and that. And for him, it was tinsel. He couldn't understand why they were fighting over what was essentially, for him, rubbish. And so he gave it her. And it sometimes happened that three or four people were appointed to the same office, more chaos. And the, 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 the um, cardinals themselves were becoming more and more irritated by this non-governance. And in addition to this, he also, Celestine also wanted to spend time fasting. So he appointed other people to run the church while he himself fasted. More chaos. And eventually he recognized that no, he's not happy, his soul is in danger, that the church is an even greater mess, and so he issued um, his, effectively his last decree. And this was the right for the Pope to resign from the See of Peter. And then a week later, he called the cardinals together and dressed in full pontificals. He took them off one by one and laid them aside, aside until he was in his simple habit and he walked out. And so he became the sixth pope to resign, Pontian, 
who, because he would, he'd been arrested and he was going to be martyred and didn't want the church to be in a state of chaos um, during his imprisonment, he resigned. And then we have um, Benedict the Ninth, who was himself unfitted, but he, he resigned. And then we, we have Gregory the Sixth, then we have Celestine, then Gregory the Twelfth, and Gregory the Twelfth resigned because again there were three claimants to the, to the to the chair of Peter, and to give peace to the church, and then finally we have Benedict the Sixteenth. So then um, Celestine was succeeded by Boniface the Eighth, and Boniface the Eighth now found himself with a church that was much in a state of confusion. But he was a strong man, and immediately he, he took charge. Unfortunately, because he took charge, there were people who were undermining him. And they were saying, oh, but um, Celestine is still Pope. And so he had Celestine, um, he called him back to Rome, um, uh, and, and, and Gani, actually, he he took it, he called him back, and Celestine attempted to escape because he was uh, fearful that he would be um, given more responsibility. But in fact, um, Boniface had him locked up in a cell. Um, the reason because there was uh, there was a possibility that there would be other people wanting to bring Celestine back. And so caused a further division in the church, but he so he he was under effectively arrest. By this time, of course, he was eighty four. Um, in fact, he's no, he was elected when he was eighty four. He was pope for just five months. That was all he could manage. And so, to, after his um, be, being kept um, in confinement. He was very happy because he says this is all he's ever wanted, to have a cell with nobody to bother him. And he, in his cell, alone, in fact, he had two companions. Um, he died after um, 10 months. And he died on the vigil of Pentecost. So we have this remarkable pope, five months, but he established some very important points that no matter what turmoil the church is going through, Christ's promise, the gates of hell will, shall not prevail, remains intact. And also we learn from him that it's, it's not holiness alone that is necessary in the governance of the church, but some very practical virtues, prudence, temperance, justice, fortitude, faith, hope, and charity. These are foundational. And so if, if, if we have these, then the, the church is, is, humanly speaking, secure and safe. If we have holiness, then that is a bonus. That is indeed even more. But holiness by itself without the, without the cardinal virtues is not going to help. And so we have, in the case of um, Benedict XVI, who resigned 719 years after Celestine, he recognized that the church was in such turmoil that he, as he said in his letter of resignation, he didn't have the health, the, the spirit, the physical strength to continue to govern the church. And sadly, and you can say the same thing in Celestine's time, you know, sadly, he re relinquished the chair of, of Peter. And um, we, we, he, he now lives almost like um, Celestine in, in a monastery enclosed. There's some really striking examples between the two. Um, when Benedict was elected, he was already 78, going on to 79. When Celestine was elected, he was already 84. Um, and they both knew that they didn't have the capacity for governance. Um, yet, the, in obedience to the spirit, they, they embraced it. They recognized when things were c coming out of control. In the case of Benedict the Sixteenth, there was he had to bear the brunt of the failures of the previous forty years and the previous two pontificates, because the sex scandal was not of his making. In fact, as prefect, he had attempted to discipline 
and to bring to justice those who had um, were abusing the, the the priesthood. But his hand was was held back. Once he became pope, he took action. Yet he's the one who is blamed and and um, held responsible for something. He made uh, in attempts to to reconcile the the various branches of the church. In particular, those who had been unjustly um, expelled the the society of of, of St. Peter, you know, he tried to reconcile it. He, he, uh, he attempted to, to restore the Mass. In fact, he gave us the freedom to celebrate the traditional rite once more. He um, also corrected the mistranslations of the new Mass. Of course, he, he attempted uh, to reconcile Europe to the, or bring re- Europe to realization that its very culture and survival was under attack, essentially, by the Muslim invasion. And in his famous uh, Regisburg speeches, that led to a big hoo-ha among the Muslims. But what has proved to be true is that he was correct, and we're seeing even now the effects of it. The same thing with the, with the Jews. They, they were very opposed to his election, and the mere fact he was German was sufficient for them to condemn him, despite the fact that he, as a boy, because when Hitler was in his heyday, he was just 14 years old, um, despite the fact that he did not belong to, he was not a supporter of Hitler, the Jews nonetheless besmirched his name uh, and so on. In fact, when we look at the news reports of what Benedict endured, you know, we really have to be, we really have to marvel that also perhaps we have a saint, someone who's willing to suffer for, um, for Christ, for the church, and above all, for the salvation of souls. So we ask Saint Celestine, the Heavenly One, to remember us in our present situation and to intercede for the Pope and the bishops of the church of our day. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Santa Maria, Mater Dei.